Good afternoon. I don't know what's happening today, but a lot of things are happening. For those of you, how many of you haven't heard me from this pulpit before? I mean, if you have not, right, few, okay, good. Um, it means then I've got to explain, as I don't preach. And those of you who know what I do is Sirlex, right? I, it is a bridge between the sermon and the lecture. And most of today will be a lecture. Um, I'm struggling. You can hear it. Um, a sister. I came to this morning, she had to help me out with a throat stuff, but um, I'm struggling. The other thing is, you know, it's good to be a Christian, don't you think so? Amen. It's good to be a Christian. I saw a lady in the back, and I said to her, what kind of glasses do you wear? <laughs> <laughs> she said, I've got business. <laughs> so, these are her glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to explain the rest. You know the rest. These are her glasses. So, it is not exactly what I normally use, but um, I'm thankful that it is one degree better than my own eyes. <laughs> and God for that. The other thing is, it's good to be at here in Slough, I've been away for quite a while. I remember the last appointment I had, I, um, I cancelled it. Because um, I was on there, and I felt I, 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 should, I should cancel it, and I did. And I haven't preached for nearly a year. That was my choice. But also, coming back here today, it's also very good to see, I noticed there's someone who shares the Sabbath school class that I share at New World. Yes, it's good to see you. Very good to see you, and it won't be the same. <laughs> All right. The sermon I have for you today is titled The Origins, pluralize it, of Jesus, or should I say the origins <coughs> and purpose of Jesus. The origins and purpose of Jesus. If I was a theologian, and I'm not a theologian, remember that. If I was a theologian, I would most likely be talking about <coughs> the nature of Christ. I can't go here. Not qualified. So I'm going to stay within my domain and look, look at the origins and purpose of Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, come among us. Yes, you are among us. The words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be accepted in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> History confirms that Jesus, the one and only Jesus of Nazareth, was real. He was born in unusual circumstances. As a child, he confounded the learned professors and philosophers with challenging questions. He walked the streets of Palestine as an itinerant preacher. He performed miracles. He taught, he taught so that everyone could understand his message. He was a friend to the poor and the neglected. Yet he was comfortable in the presence of royalty, the rich and the powerful. Jesus was an all thing to all people if they accepted him. Yet he died, resurrected, and ascended to the heaven. Jesus of Nazareth was unique. <coughs> no one who is even half witted, no atheist, no Richard Dawkins can deny that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical figure. Yes. As Christians, 
We believe that Jesus was both God and man. We accept this by faith. So if a humanist does not believe the way we do, we must accept that it is by faith that we believe the way we do. I don't fight them. Just be nice to them. Faith, I believe, is not devoid of reason. My faith is always based on something tangible, even though I may not always know all the background facts. Jesus' birth, life and teachings, his betrayal, trial, crucifixion and burial, his resurrection and ascension are all historical facts. Both secular and religious history tells us that Jesus of Nazareth was a man who lived some 2,000 years ago. Since Jesus was a man, we know that the origin of all humans, since Adam, must be from a sperm and an egg. The male producing the sperm and the female the egg. Any such offspring has half the genes of the father and half of the mother. I am therefore half weight from my father and half McFarlane from my mother. Secular history at the time of Joseph and Mary records that both Joseph and Mary knew that Joseph was not the biological parent of Jesus. Yet, contrary to the custom of the day, Joseph did not divorce Mary. Religious history tells us that Joseph was told in a dream that he should not divorce Mary because she had not done anything wrong. That the child was, in fact, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 and verse 35 tells us, The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will cover you. For this reason the baby will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. Matthew 1, 18, This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother, Mary, was engaged to marry Joseph, but before they married, she learned she was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1 20, while Joseph thought about these things, an angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. The angel said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the baby in her is from the Holy Spirit. Jesus was unique. He's the only one known to be conceived by the Holy Spirit and an egg from a woman. The only one. The origin of Jesus was different from that of Adam and Eve. I would say that the triune God used technology to make Adam. They molded dust from the earth into a shape. Then God himself directed oxygen into the nostrils of the shame and brought it to life. This cannot be repeated. We don't know the formula, so don't try. I would further say that the triune God then utilized genetic engineering skill, his genetic engineering skills to make Eve. All the living cells of Adam contained the chromosomes and the rich gene pool of the human race. Black, Chinese, and Caucasian genes. God anesthetized Adam, took a sample from a rib, removed the Y chromosomes, and added another X chromosome, improved the model, and presented her to Adam, who named her Eve. Oh of his bone and the flesh of his flesh, woman. After fertilization, after the fertilization of Mary's egg, God allowed the normal nine months gestation period for Jesus to be developed 
in her uterus. History tells us that Jesus had a normal human birth and childhood. Jesus was human. Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit that came upon Mary is one member of the triune God. He is God. It is therefore logical to conclude that in a similar way that I am both weight and not falling, Jesus was both God and human. God and man. When I say, my father who is in Jamaica, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Similarly, when Jesus said, my father who is in heaven, that connection should be clear. Very clear. The origin of Jesus as God mentioned, therefore, not be so hard to understood and to accept. Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be pregnant. She will have a son and she will name him Emmanuel. What's the rest? Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. Demographic studies tell us that world population is increasing at about 140 million a year. 140 million a year. Just a week ago, the population of the world reached what? Seven billion. In 1927, we're going back now, it was 2 billion. In the year 1000, it was only 275 million, not billions. In 180, year one, there were two ones right there. There was one what? BC, and there was after that, there was one AD. In 180, it was only 200 million. And in 10,000 BC, still going back, it was four, estimated to be 4 million. Due to lack of data, I can only trace my direct family to only so far back, not very far back. But I know that 10 years ago, I had fewer family members than I have today. And if I go further back to say 50 years ago, there were fewer still. And the further back I go, the number gets less and less. If you would like to be correct, fewer and fewer. But if I continue going back in time, eventually I arrive, I arrive at just one couple, Adam and Eve. Remember, I'm tracing my family line back. Until I come to Adam and Eve, <coughs> they are my four parents and yours. This means that all the 110 billion people that have ever lived on earth since Adam and Eve are my family and yours. Acts 17, verse 26. God began by making one person, and from him came all the different people who live everywhere in the world. God decided exactly where and when they should live. So don't be perplexed when you see most of Africa is black. And most of Europe is white. And when you go over the east, you see Chinese. Don't be perplexed. It's ordained by God. Amen. I could develop that, but that's a different sermon. Scripture is clear. We are all related. One blood. Blood related. It is reasonable, therefore, to observe that through the ages, the blood just got a little diluted and picked up a bit of disease here and there. And so we might not be as well, as healthy as we used to be, or as Adam and Eve were. But things have happened. Things that could have happened then, 
brothers, brothers and sisters way back then and no genetic aberration can't happen today. It will cause genetic aberration today because the gene pool is weak. But that is another story. In the case of Jesus, his human form can also be traced back to Adam. Jesus is therefore our blood brother. He was human. But he's more than that. He was and is God. Let us explore just a little further the origin of Jesus as God. Genesis 1 verse 1 and we all know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We don't know exactly when that was. Only that it was at the beginning of something. It may have been at the beginning of our solar system or our galaxy, the Milky Way. We can't be sure. But we know that sometime after God created the earth, he said, let us make man in our image. Genesis 1.26. After he created the earth, at that time he said, in the beginning. He said, let us create man. The us in the case of Jesus was with God when mankind was created. That wasn't too long ago. No, no, it wasn't too long ago. True science shows that organic earth is not very old. And it was after organic earth was created that the Trinity said, let us make man. So if organic earth is not very old and man came after organic earth, we are not at all. John 1, 1 to 3, let's look at that. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word and that the Word is God. Jesus is Jesus is God. Verse 2 tells us Jesus was with God in the very beginning. This is a different beginning from the one uh, we have in Genesis 1 and verse 1. They're not the same. The beginning of John 1 2 is an earlier one, as I've said. Verse 3 tells us all things were made by Jesus and nothing was made without him. All things from the very beginning were made by Jesus. We live on earth within our <coughs> solar system, perched on an arm of our galaxy. Cosmologists tell us there are billions and billions of other galaxies out there making up the universe. These galaxies and other physical features show evidence that they were designed, made by an intelligent force superior to humankind. Things like some galaxies are so remote that astronomers, most powerful telescope, cannot see them. They're so far out. You cannot see them even with your most powerful telescope. We discover that nature is made up of rhythm. Rest time provides energy for work time. Cesium, we discover, pulsates accurately telling the time. No need for us, for us to, to wind, up, wind up that chemical clock. It oscillates. We don't need to do anything about that. We discover that the hummingbird's heart beats about 1,300 times per minute. The hummingbird's heart, 1,300 times per minute. And that its wings, they beat 60 times per second. Whoa, 60 times. Can you imagine it? Can any of us achieve that? We also observe motion in space that we do not understand. We can observe from God, but there are a lot of things we cannot explain. The universe is made in such a way that it clearly reveals the awesomeness of its creator. It points all living, 
It points all people in all places and at all times to the supreme creator who is greater than what he has made. He who made it is greater than it. Roman one, Romans 1 and verse 20, there are things about him that people cannot see. His eternal power and all the things that make him God. But since the beginning of the world, earth, the, those things have been easy to understand by what God has made. The origin of earth or the universe is beyond the remit of science. We cannot study the behavior of we can sorry study the behavior of gases in the atmosphere, but we cannot make them. No, we cannot make them from nothing. He who made the universe is therefore greater than it. But while science reveals many properties of the universe, it cannot establish its origin. If we are able to establish the origin, if we are unable to establish the origin of Earth, which we walk on every day, how are we going to establish the origin of God, who is greater than the universe, the borders of which we do not know? The best source of knowledge of how the Earth and the universe came about is through Revelation, the Bible. It is this same Bible that tells us that Jesus was God. Jesus was with God from the beginning. But God is eternal. That is an easy way out. We don't know a lot about God more than what is explained to us. All we know that God is eternal. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him, Jesus. Psalm 93 and verse 2, your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. And then quite adds clarity to this in Zach ages, page 19. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty. It was to manifest his glory that he came to our world, to manifest God's glory that Jesus came to our earth. He came to reveal the light of God's love that was and is the purpose of Jesus. Jesus, who was with God from eternity, came to reveal the light of God's love. We human are limited. We know so much, yet we know so little. We know how to make an airplane fly, how to cook a delicious meal and make beautiful dresses and hairstyles, how to detect oxygen which we cannot see, but we don't know the origin of gravity which keeps us on the ground. We think, but we don't know the source of thought. We depend on our iPhones, but we do not know the origin of the waves that carry the messages. We train telescopes on stars in deep space, analyze the lights, and identify the chemicals that emit those lights, because each chemical gives off its characteristic light. So we can know what chemical is coming from the light. In a similar way, when the living water of scripture soaks into the heart of a sinner, 
we see a life change for the better. Because the human heart, made in the image of God, can connect with God. The human heart, that's why preaching is effective in the evangelistic campaign. The human heart, there is something there that when you touch it with the word of God, connects. And the person's life is changed. A changed life, therefore, reminds us that God is real <coughs> and His Word has power. Amen. Titus 3 and verse 5. He saved us because of His mercy. It was not because of any good deeds we did to be right with Him. He saved us through the power of the Holy Spirit. God tells us through revelation that Jesus was with him from the beginning. He tells us that Jesus had a unique birth. He tells us that Jesus, who was God in heaven, agreed to come as a baby in human form for a specific purpose. God has not left us in darkness. He has given us many tangible evidence on which to build our faith so we can have confidence to accept the things we cannot see. He has given us the experience of the Israelites. Miracles in Egypt as recorded by secular history. Crossing of the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Provided chicken in the desert to feed thousands of people. Provided manna for six days a week and none on the seventh day to remind us that the Sabbath is holy unto the Lord. Amen. God told them that they had to make sacrifices, the shedding of blood for their sins. God established that blood had to be shed to pay the price of sin. There was no alternatives. Some, no doubt, from the effort of finding a spotless lamb for the sin offering, and it, it, an inconvenience. And if it was now, the animal rights group would protest. But inconvenience or not, blood had to be shed for the remission, the forgiveness of sin. What's the fact? That shedding of blood was essential for the forgiveness of sin. A strategic conference was held in heaven. And Jesus, who lived in luxury with his father since eternity, offered to shed his blood once and for all as a free gift to save the billions of planet Earth. Romans 8 and verse 3 tells us that God sent Jesus to earth with the same human life that others used to sin. Used, used, used to sin. The same human life that you and I used to sin, that's the same human life Jesus had. But he conquered sin. He did not sin. Romans 5 and verse 17. One man, Adam, sinned. And so death ruled all people because of that one man. But now those people who accept God's full grace and the great gift of being made right with him will, sh will surely have true life. True life through one man, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 makes it clear. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. One man, Adam, sinned. One man, Jesus, willingly died to save all. That seems reasonable to me. But it's up to us to accept that free gift. It may be reasonable to me, but it's up to you. There is no, no inconvenience in finding the sin offering. Jesus is the Lamb. There is no need for anyone to protest over the slaughtering of animals for sin offerings. Jesus paid the ultimate price. 
He was and is mankind's sin offering. That was and is the purpose of Jesus, the God man. Jesus did things that no other human could and can do. He turned water into wine. He walked on water. But we can do something that he did. Connect with God. The God who divided the water of the Red Sea for the Israelites and sinners to walk to safety. The God that provided food for thousands in the desert. Jesus makes him credible to us. Jesus established the credentials of God so we can believe the things that God says. The things that we cannot see. He makes it easy for us to believe so that our faith in God can be as strong as our knowledge of science through the evidence we see. Jesus says, don't worry. You will never see a physical father, God. But he has done many physical acts so that no human or human, so many physical acts that no human or human devices can repeat. He raised the dead. Praise God, Jesus is alive. He provides unmistakable evidence of his existence that cannot be challenged by human. All his predictions are accurate. You don't have to worry about when somebody said the end of the earth will come with whenever. We know God's word is true. His little creatures are wonderfully made. The hummingbird's wings beat 60 times each second. A bee travels an average of 1,600 round trips in order to produce just one ounce of honey. That is six miles per trip, 12 miles per round trip. And to produce two pounds of honey, these bees have to travel a distance of six times, sorry, four times around the world. Now you try that. <laughs> you try that. And the bees don't take the lift on any satellites or any airplane or any ship. They do it on their own little fragile wings and body. God may think about it. These achievements tell us that there is an intelligent source, a creator that is greater than mankind. His name is Yahweh, Jehovah God. I cannot see oxygen, but when I see you alive, I know there is oxygen in the room. Amen. If there was no oxygen in the room, we all would be Amen. dead. We may not be able to see a physical God, but Jesus said, if in doubt, look at me, for when you see me, you see that? Jesus answered, I have been with you a long time. It is John 14, 9. I have been with you a long time now. Do you still not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So why do you say, show me the Father? Think about it. That means he wasn't looking at Jesus and he was making the connection. They was thinking about the political role Jesus was to play. That is a purpose of Jesus, to reveal God to us. Paul, a sinner, wrote, The things I know I should do, I don't do them. The things I shouldn't do, that I find myself doing. But Jesus said, don't worry, I died so that your sins will be forgiven. That is the purpose of Jesus. So when I know I have sinned and I'm prepared to confess my sins to God, I can declare, oh wretched person that I am, and then reflect on a hill far away, 
stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross, for on it, Jesus willingly died for me. That is the purpose of Jesus. But if I, but if I stubbornly hold on to my sins and want God to accept me without repentance, I might hear a voice saying, Oh, sinner man, where are you going to run to? Defiantly, I might shout back when I run to the rock and said, please hide me. But the rock cried out, I can't hide you. I said, rock, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you, rock? Don't you see I need you, rock? So I run to the river, and it was bleeding, in disgust, and still on my high horse, I run to another river, when it was boiling. So I run to the Lord, still without repentance, Hide me, Lord. Don't you see me praying? Don't you see me? Don't hear praying? But the Lord said, go to the devil. So I ran, ran to the devil. And he was waiting. Frightened. I cried out, power. So I ran back to the Lord. I said, Lord, hide me. Please hide me. He said, child, where are you when you ought to be praying? I said, Lord, Lord, hear me praying. Sinner man, you ought to be praying. I cried, power, 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 Lord, and repented. Power, Lord. Don't you know I need you, Lord? Don't you know that I need you? Forgive me, Lord. Power, Lord. Jesus gave his blood free gift on the cross, grace, grace for our sins. Now he's at the right hand of his father, pleading for you and me. Recognize his power, recognize the gift, accept <coughs> the gift, turn to him in repentance on a daily basis. He'll accept and declare you justified, innocent and give you the crown of righteousness. That is the purpose of Jesus.